Hello and welcome to, I have to admit, not my favourite Admiral ever. And, well, I have a reason for this. I'm not his biggest fan, I have to admit. I, I, I'm never going to claim to be otherwise. And that's not because I'm particularly cruel. It's not because I'm particularly nasty. It's just because, frankly, I don't think he does that great a job. And at some point, it has to be omitted. He doesn't do that great a job. And that doesn't make him an evil person. It does make him not that great at his job, but it doesn't make him evil. It makes him many other annoying things. You certainly have to admit that, but not evil. However, Donets, 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 Donets. Well, he is the only naval officer we've talked about who managed to achieve head of state. Admittedly, that's the last few days of a despotic, diabolic regime, which frankly was so chaotically run and managed that I am honestly surprised every time it lasts for as long as it does. And I often think that half the reason it gets held up in as high a standard as it is is because after, as it even is, is that even is that afterwards the Allies were going looking around the mess that is Germany and looking around the mess that was their decision making process and going, wow, we look like we are absolute mm, taking so long to defeat them. Seriously, we have to do PR for these people because otherwise we are going to look like twits. And they do. Carl Donuts, an outline. Well, he begins his career in 1910. Uh, he is... How do I put this politely about Carl? He is definitely never my favourite, by any stretch of the imagination. Mainly because I just find him so single-track, and the thing... This is this is uh, this colors my judgment to an extent. I must admit, I find any person who approaches all problems with saying that they have a simple solution to them lacks nuance. He starts off with cruisers and the battle cruiser, the Gorbum, and uh, well, he's part of them when they're sold to the Ottoman Navy. He is, in 1916, transferred to the submarine forces, and, well, he attends submariner's school, starts becoming a, a serves as a watch officer on U-39 in, from f in, in about 1917. And February 19 onwards, uh, February 1918 onwards, as commander of UC 25. In July 1918, he became commander of UB 68, operating in the Mediterranean. This is where he suffers technical difficulties and is captured by the British and is incarcerated for two years. So, this officer's experience of submarine warfare was a bit of time in 1917 as a watch officer, a commander of one sub and then another sub, which July, August, September, October, charitably you can say four months in charge of, and he gets captured and taken prisoner, and spends two years as prisoner. 
Two years. And then this other stuff. After World War II, he is um, he's not found guilty of committing crimes against humanity. He's one of the few people the Allies and prosecutors actually believe didn't realise what was going on. Their view was he was either that myopic, considering how closely he worked with Speer and Hitler at the end, or he was just that dense. I'd say myopic. Very, very single focused. And I know I'm being a bit rude, but. Which it doesn't, isn't my normal style. I hope, as you've seen the rambles, but there is something about Donuts which. He plays politics better than Raider does. You have to admit that. Or rather. He gets more entwined in politics than Raider does. Raider, for all his faults, and he has many, separates strategy from politics and doesn't drink the Kool-Aid. Donitz does. And Donitz gets the promotion to being Chief of Cell Navy simply because he is the most loyal. And it's his loyalty, which is why Hitler singles him out in the end. And it's also why, in the end, there is an admiral who signs the um, surrender documents. Because, well, he has an admiral with him. He loses both sons in World War II. He has three children. And even though Hitler had signed a thing into commission which meant that if you were a senior military leader and you'd already lost one son, you only had one son left, uh, the other son could be withdrawn from combat service and return to civilian life. Um, his, I think, his youngest son, Peter, is killed on U-954. And then Klaus, his eldest son, his eldest child was a daughter, um, Ursula. Klaus becomes a doctor, is being trained as an old doctor. But for his birthday, he decides to um, go out on a Schnellboot, any, or e boat, uh, S141, for the raid on Celsi, and is sunk by a French destroyer. La Combatite, um, a hunt class escort destroyer, as British built, French operated. After the war, he is given 10 years for the crimes he's found guilty of, which are crimes against peace and crimes against the laws of war. Give you some context. In Britain today, there are lots of mandatory minimums, there are lots of mandatory minimum sentences around the world. You can get Five years imprisonment for possession, purchase, acquisition, manufacture, transfer, or sale of a prohibited firearm or weapon for the first or subsequent time. So he got for possession of several hundred submarines. Which I'd have said, I know treaties might have changed, but were technically at a certain point prohibited weapons for the uh, Germans. He only got 10 years. He is the exact opposite of Canaris. Canaris is not a nice guy, but I have respect for him, for what he did, for the speaking truth to power, and I have... He, he, he keeps himself. Raider knows who he's dealing with, and chooses to try to Nazify in the naval fashion the Navy 
rather than risk the Nazi passion, uh, Nazi party trying to Nazify it in a Nazi fashion. But tries to always, he tries to turn the navy's navy, uh, well, turn Nazism to the navy rather than navy to Nazism. His whole philosophy of uh, of uh, is he thinking and you know, Raider was CMAC theology. Uh, theology and those things. Donitz isn't. Donitz really isn't. And it's for that reason I probably find him less palatable to be on this list. Because, to my mind, especially when you're chief of staff, you're supposed to stand for something. You're supposed to be something more than blind loyalty to a regime because you are making the gambles and making decisions which affect thousands of lives. I'm going to expand this out a bit because otherwise you'll never see some of the tiny writing. So, as submarine admiral, well, Donnett supposed Raider's belief that surface ships should be given priority in the Kriegsmarine during the war when plans were made in, the, uh, made in 1935. However, and this is the real kicker, he also doubted that the submarines could really deliver on all the promises he was making. He didn't think they were long enough ranged. He didn't think they were fast enough. He thought there were issues of uh, issues of resupply. And this was even fighting France and Russia. The fact is, Donitz's whole plan, without realizing it, rested on the capture of Norway and France. Without those things, he would never have been able to achieve half of what he achieved. And he wasn't planning of those. The Wolf Pack, which is so often attributed to Donitz, isn't his idea. It's a gentleman called Herman Buer who comes up with it during World War One, but of course doesn't really get to achieve much of a hum World War One. Um, Rule tactic or pack tactic. The idea was you turn up with enough submarines, you overwhelm the convoy escorts because the escorts need to be one or two, uh, at least one, two, three, possibly. So, uh, escort, uh, escorts to engage a single submarine and prosecute it properly. So you t uh, if the fleet has got 24 escorts protecting it on this convoy, sounds amazing, it's 24 escorts. You turn up with nine submarines, they're in trouble. You turn up with 12 submarines, they're in a lot of trouble. You turn up with 18 submarines, ouch. You turn up with 24 submarines, <laughs> in simple terms, it's nothing sim It's nothing more complicated than mass warfare. You turn up with more than your enemy has, you overwhelm them. It's the current statistics which we often use when discussing missiles in modern warfare. How you overwhelm an enemy. Well, you work out. How many SAMs does it take to engage most cruise missiles? Let's be honest and say probably two. Okay, so you divide a surface to air, whatever the surface to air load is of your VLS toting escort by two, and that's the number of missiles that can engage. Then do the whole thing for the whole task force, and that's your defense saturation point. You only need a few more missiles, more than two, more than that number, and uh, you can win. So, his preference for the submarine fleet was a production of large numbers of smaller craft. He didn't like the bigger submarines. He liked being close. He was 
Oh, he was Stewie Griffin. Honestly, this is the, that, that's just the phrase. Every time I read some of the stuff he talks about, some rains, it just goes through my mind. Um, if you've ever seen it, there's an episode of a program called Family Guy. A character called Stewie Griffin, who technically is supposed to be one of the babies. Um, but seriously, acts like a 70-year-old man. And at one point, his elder brother, Chris, is joining the Navy for some sort of reason. They're considering a Navy school. And the, basically, the school's being sold as, this will be past uh, long times at sea with other men, with men, in close proximity to men, smelling men, all those sort of things. And he's sitting there going, yeah, you are making a joke about Various parts, which if I get into, I'm going to be airing enough close to the things with YouTube, thanks to mentioning various parts of Nazi Germany in this one. I'm not going there as well. But you can imagine the joke and skip they're making. And Stewie basically says, this is a Do you have a pre tween program? He is obsessed with the camaraderie. I don't think he's any. Yeah, myself, I'm fairly sure Carl Bonnet doesn't have any homosexual tendencies or anything like that. Not that there'd be anything wrong if he did, although he then goes around and killing them, which would be some sort of complex would be on belief. But we'll leave that to one side. He just seems obsessed with the camaraderie of being in tight quarters in a submarine. Now, if you've been on a modern submarine, they're tight enough and they can stink. Be at sea for a couple of a few days, tight up, it's they're fairly warm. The smell can get fairly very ripe. They do their best, but it can get right. Small submarines, they're, they're tighter. No one in their right mind wants to encourage that or thinks that's a good thing. He does. Anyway, um, he believed also that small subs, he could get produced in large numbers. And... Basically, this causes a lot of problems. So if you consider the later German submarine productions and all those things, the submarine limits, they're mostly thanks to him and his ideas of preferring small over big. And then in 1939, he comes up with this plan, Z, for 1948. And supported by Radar, puts forward the idea that they would need at least 300 submarines. Operational i.e. not in training or anything, uh, to win a war against Britain. And, of course, the presumption is, a, is of course, that, it, that Germany manages to build 300 submarines without the Royal Navy paying attention and going, you're building a lot of submarines and are not doing one of three options. Copenhagening them. This is the Royal Navy. You can never discount Copenhagening. You can never discount it. In fact, if I was modern China, I'd, it, I'd be sometimes more worried about the British doing that than the Americans. Especially if, if I don't know, British government start talking about expanding the Royal Navy rapidly. But don't explain how they're going to build it. At that point, you know, anyone who's got a decent sized fleet needs to start making sure the padlocks are, are done up properly. Secondly, you can destroy the enemy in harbour. Again, though, both of these are quite offensive actions. Other option the British could do, I don't know. Um, what did they launch in 19... Well, started off in 1937, looking at it, and, well, they started off in, as it's been over the Battle Atlantic and various things. So from, they are looking at a continual anti-submarine warfare escort program. In 1937, 38, they start looking at what do we need to fit in, 38, they're looking around for the ship. Once they've worked out what they need to go in there, they're looking out for the ship that's suitable. Hull size and shape, 1939, they're ordering it. The thing is, if, even if, and I am, this is a big if, if you consider the statistics we're going to talk about in a second, Germany had managed to build 300 submarines by 1948, and Let's be honest, they probably had to build a whole new fleet by that point, so let's consider that, you know, 10 years worth of submarine conduction, and they achieve 30 submarines a year. Which is good going. Uh, 
Now that's a lot of subs. The Royal Navy would probably have had to have been ordering somewhere in the region of 60 to 120 sloops, or could have been ordering 60 to 120 corvette sloops a year in that period across the Royal Navies, because the Royal Navy wasn't just ordering them, the Canadians were, the French were even ordering flag class corvettes, the Australians, the Indians, every one of the Royal Navies that could be was being mobilized for it. So that becomes a lot of escorts. Again, it's German industrial capacity that's limiting them. And this is how limiting them are, because that's me saying about 30 submarines a year. In 1935, they'd managed to launch 14. In 1936, 21. That's a bump a year because in 1937, it goes down to 1. In 1938, 9. In 1939, 18. So between 1935 and 1939, the... Love uh, that the German submarine arm. This is what they're supposed to be their premier attack arm, according to Donetsk, who's so close to the Nazi party, it's beyond belief. So can really make his case with them all. And they get sixty-three submarines, and they say they need three hundred. So they're only 240 short. All right. So as chief of staff, well, when he takes over from Raider, which principally he does thanks to his far, far closer relationship with the Nazi party and the fact that Hitler trusts him absolutely. This is one of the interesting things, and my rule of thumb, if the person getting the promotion doesn't feel like they deserve it, then you've got two scenarios potentially going on there. Because someone who's suffering heavily from imposter syndrome which is something you have to watch out for because it could cripple their command-making decisions at certain points because they could start worrying, but hang on, what happens if I make that decision? Will I be making the right decision? Will people think I'm making the right decision and getting all sorts of paranoid? Or two, they're really not up to the job and they really shouldn't be anywhere near there. Either way, you've got a problem. One is a problem of confidence and one is a problem of actual ability. Donitz doesn't suffer from imposter syndrome. I, I'm sorry, he suffers from many things, but not imposter syndrome. But he really doesn't seem to think, and this comes through in almost every book I've read about him, and I've read far too many. I haven't liked any single one of them enough to recommend, but I've read far too many. There are far more available on Donitz than anyone else discussed in this entire series. I mean, it is disturbing quite how many books have been written about someone who is, at best, a mediocre admiral. At best. And I... I have tried to be fair the whole way through. And I'm going to enjoy the live, which is going to be uh, later the day this is released. And discussing him then, because I can imagine some of the responses I'm going to get, and some of the people going technical things. And if he was in the Royal Navy, there would have been a place for him. It might have been flag officer submarines. I doubt it. I have a feeling he would have ended up because his actual skills, if he has any, lie in more the bureaucracy side. In fact, in the Royal Navy, I could have seen him being retired 
and then made a civilian appointment in the DNC, looking into submarine construction. Somewhere where his predilections for various things wouldn't colour the judgment too much, but where his drive for building submarines and organising them would be of, uh, of advantage. His very smart thing he does do is get U-boat production transferred from Goring's four-year plan to Speer's various systems. Mainly he susses out who's actually Hitler's favourite and who's got the power. Never hurts. But again, this is what makes me, considering all the various parts of the final solution holocaust that Speer was involved in, that Goring was involved in, and that Donitz had to deal with these people and see their off uh, the products and the advance so often. Yeah. So, his overarching plan, and this he inherits from when he was in charge of submarines, when he was the Befisaba uh, the boot, the U boot, Befisaba the boot, and now he's the Obasa Befisala. Do you please me? Lovely. I can't, I'm not pronouncing them well. I do apologize. He. His plan is the enemy's shipping constitutes one single great entity. It is therefore a material where a ship is sunk. Once it has been destroyed, it has to be replaced by a new ship, and that is that. True. Very true. You can't say it isn't. But. For that to be true and be valid, you therefore have to sink the ships. And therefore everything is put upon sinking of the ships. And this is the ultimate problem about the wolf pack tactics. Because you concentrate the submarines into wolf packs, which then turns it into an intelligence battle of where are the wolf packs versus where are the convoys? Can we route the convoys around the wolf packs? Can we do all the options which are done? And it's a technology battle. And there are some times which they do really well. Although I have to admit some of the claims I find quite funny. Um, let's see. There is one point at which he... Let's see. There's one point at which he sinks a convoy. Uh, a, a, a battle uh, has taken on against a convoy TM1. Uh, this is in 1943, and they lose a hundred thousand tons of fuel. It's devastating in many respects. Only two of nine tankers reach port, but then it's the British Eighth Army were forced to ration their fuel for a time, earning Donitz the gratitude of the Africa Corps. And you sit there and go, okay, so where are those uh, those tankers? They're heading to Gibraltar. Huh? Well, here is the reality. If the tankers are going to Gibraltar, they are probably not going to the Afri uh, to the Eighth Army because most of the Eighth Army's fuel comes from the Persian Gulf where it's done in far refineries, especially after America enters the war. It's the, there are refineries in Bahrain and various other places, in, even in this period, and it's moved around. And yes, some fuel does go, but it, it, it's very small. Most of the fuel which is going for Gibraltar is either for Gibraltar or for Malta. There aren't Let's think about this from a history perspective. We've all we, we we've all gone and read the various books. If you haven't read the books, please go watch my various videos about the Mediterranean War. There aren't many convoys which go across the whole length of the Mediterranean. They're not a regular thing. 
So if the 8th Army is suffering lack of fuel, that suggests the fuel's going somewhere else, and, well, that might not be to do with him knocking out a convoy. There might be, I don't know, a war versus the Japanese. The army in Burma might be needing supplies. Australia might be needing supplies. There are lots of reasons why fuel and supplies might be limited to the 8th Army. No, I doubt it's that convoy. There are lots of battles which are very, very critical convoy battles. There are also lots of battles which don't happen. And they don't happen because of the intelligence battle going on. And this is one of the interesting things, because Donitz has the opportunity for me to actually, well, for anyone probably, to start actually respecting him as an admiral. In that he starts to think, well, there is something going wrong here. How did the enemy know where we are? Now, whilst... Many of the secrets of World War I had not managed to make it out. The knowledge that the British were fairly committed to electronic warfare was a sort of open secret. Not the, the full details, but, you know, that they were interested in it and were fairly committed to it was an open secret. Yet it takes him a great time to really get suspicious. And even when he does get suspicious... <laughs> He lets himself be persuaded not to be suspicious. You are the CNC. Not only are you the commander in chief of the submarines, but because of the way you are acting, you have retained that role despite being now chief of staff and navy. Instead of going up and taking a overview of the naval service and strategy and trying to sort out things decently that way, you have basically taken your submarines up and made your submarines the navy. Good for you, if that's your route. But that means you don't need to start the strategy and look at the submarines. And you also have the power and the authority that you could change codebooks. You, there are spare codebooks produced. You don't really have to have a good reason. You can just go change, chop. Honestly, and this might be just me, but if I had become chief of staff in the middle of a war, the first thing I'd have done, even if I didn't have any suspicions of the, our communications being compromised, would be to swap all the codes. Just order it done. Yes, it'll cause disruption, but it's sensible to get it done. In fact, I would have been changing the code, uh, code books quite regularly throughout the war, so at no point could anyone really have long-term hacking of me. And finally, there's this final point. He persuaded Hitler that the destruction of the surface fleet would provide the British with a victory and heat pressure on the U-boats, for these warships were tying down British air and naval forces that would otherwise be sent into the Atlantic or elsewhere. The emphasis is really is elsewhere. If you, you don't use cruisers for anti-submarine warfare, uh, some of the smaller cruisers might have ended up escorting convoys, but that would just be a nightmare for people who are planning on attacking them. As for the rest, Well, as I put there, I think if Hitler had gone through that in 1943, I have a feeling that, especially with Italy out the war, you would probably be looking at every single Queen Elizabeth class available, every King George V available, every battleship available, probably Renown included, um, that the British had every carrier available, 
more than likely mo every heavy cruiser they had available would have gone straight to the Far East. Destroyers. That's interesting. Actually, I have a converse thing because I think the tribal class destroyers would have actually stayed in Europe for much the same time as they did because they would need to, still needed to do what they would do at D-Day and in the battles of Ashant. But a large chunk of destroyers and a large chunk, and I'm saying this honestly, a large chunk of the light cruisers would have gone with those forces. Because all Britain would have needed to maintain in Europe was pretty much the same forces they would be maintaining in Europe in the nineteen forty five in nineteen forty five post uh, post D Day really you know their escort carriers and smaller ships there are a few bigger ships hanging around but the rest are heading out to the Pacific and this would have just had it happen in nineteen forty three with an interesting knock on for Japan because if you have a stronger British fleet operating in the Pacific from 1943, things might get a bit more aggressive because you have more ships available and you have competition. <sighs> I don't like this map. I don't like how one of the first things he thinks to think to blame on his communication issues are is to blame them on the Italians and suggest there's been an Italian leak. And I honestly find it quite disconcerting how obsessed he gets with the Nazi party. I was talking, I've been talking about Canaris, I've talked about Raider, they all get captured by it, but... Donitz is closest to an officer who I haven't looked at in this one because he's not a naval officer. Heidrich Himmel. I mean, Heidrich and Himmler. I keep combining those two. Reiner, Heinrich, and Himmler. I don't like them. You're supposed to, when you're presenting as a nail historian, as a historian in class, you have to try and keep yourself to an extent impartial. But I'm not. I, I, you can never really. You try and keep it impartial. There, there are. It's one of those things. I can be impartial about people's politics as long as I respect them. I don't respect them. And uh, the, the lack of respect shows through quite quickly. I have to say, um, Parona is another officer I'm not that keen on. <laughs> Honestly, there are all sorts of uh, stories about him. The fall of the government. I'm admitting I'm not his biggest fan to begin with. And there are people who are probably going to come back to me and go, but, you know, he did this, he did that, and, you know, he was this. His solution to everything was more submarines. By 1945, he has 425, 429 submarines available and 144 operational. Later on, 166. During Operation Torch, he has 196 submarines in the Atlantic and he fails to prevent it. Doesn't even realize it's taking place. He's just so ecstatic about the number of kills he's getting. No point does he take a step back and be an admiral and go, hang on. Getting all these kills. Escort numbers appear to be slightly light. Where are the escorts? That's because the escorts are all around Torch. Torch is the, basically an escort per meter all around it. There's a ring of 
so, uh, ring or surface uh, of, you know, anti-submarine steel. It will get across the Atlantic. The Allies are prepared to accept losses in the merchant shipping, which they prefer not to have, but they're prepared to accept it, as long as Torch gets to North Africa. Good points about him. When he realizes the torpedo isn't working, he gets the magnetic water, magnetic detonator. Sorry. He gets the magnetic detonators out and replaced with contact detonators and, you know, all sorts of things. He is good in that regard. But. On various things, I've been talking about a recent story, which is going to date this video. It's produced in 2021, for anyone who is not sure. And there was a recent news article, which was a U.S. Rear Admiral says at a, said at a dinner party evening function, I'm not a strategician, I'm just an operator. This is an operator, not a strategician. That is the point. He shouldn't be an admiral. If he is going to be an admiral, may uh, potentially running the submarines, yeah, it's fine. Just keep them going out and let someone else do the strategy. And that is the real point. In the last episode in this series, I'm going to get into the person who really does come up with the strategy for Germany in terms of submarine warfare and how to fight the British. There is an admiral who does really come up. He's not in World War II. He's in from World War One, And he is a really smart admiral. Again, not a nice guy. I, again, please. There, I, I, I can honestly say there is not really in here a single officer who I would consider a nice person. I have been looking at them, studying them to prepare this for about Three, four months intensely, and been preparing and study, studying about them for the years before then. There is not a single one Well, maybe one. There is one, potentially. Yeah. I'll go with one. And he's actually going to be the officer I'm going to be talking about tomorrow. Uh, Raphael de Cotton, who is the last chief of staff of the Raja Marina. But of the rest of the list, and I'm looking through this list. Raider? Nope. Prince Fushimi Harioso? No. Domenico Cavalli? No. Wilhelm Canaris? Could be interesting, but I wouldn't want to sit with him for over dinner. I'd be worried what was put in my food. Arturo Riccardi? No. I would possibly end up hitting him over the head with something. Um, Osama Nagano, 
perfectly decent admiral. But, like Hiryosu, orders a fair number of bombings of towns, etc., and various other things, which, no, I don't want to have dinner with you. Donuts, I've been over. Frankly, a raving Nazi. Literally. Uh, Shigurato Shimrado. Koshiro, Koshiro Akuma. Hmm. So many toida. And the last admiral, the one who we're going to talk about at last, Henning von Holsendorf. Well, again, not the nicest of people in the world, but a decent admiral. And that's been the point of this whole video series and is the point of this whole video series and I feel like I'm summing up to an extent when I'm only at part 7 of 12 but the reason I'm doing this is because I have a feeling that part 7 is probably going to be the most watched and I really would like you to go and watch the rest of them because you're gonna find the story of Raphael de Corton interesting. You're possibly not gonna have heard the story of the three Japanese chief staff. If you have you might have heard of one of them, two of them, all three. I had a fun discussion with students when I was starting off this. When I asked them, how many chiefs of staff did the Japanese go through in the period of World War II? And they were all looking at me. And one of them, who I would consider a very passionate Asiatic historian, very passionate about Asia, he was I can wear my fingers and went, three? Because those were the three names she could remember. And she, a good student who watches this channel, so will like that, and does would like uh, has asked to be mentioned at points. So there you go. You mentioned without being named. <sighs> Which is also why I know YouTube, you lie on your settings when you say no women watch my videos. I know they do. The starters, my cousins do. Mainly to critique my shirt t-shirt choices. But leaving that to one side. Donuts. No. And summary of Donuts. He was not up to the task. At no point was he up to the task. He achieved motion thanks to connections, thanks to obsession, and thanks to luck and there being so few other candidates. But he wasn't up to the task. He was a one-trick pony, and that wasn't even his trick. It was a trick he got from someone else. And he micromanaged though that trick. He couldn't trust in subordinates. One of the interesting things about the Wolf Pack, if you look at the ideas put forward originally, is one of the conceivable ideas in considering the First World War was that they have low powered short wave radios that won't be hurt around the world. And that the submarines use this to coordinate themselves. And they move as a pack and they are a flotilla. They literally, literally leave more together. instead of having central locations and you know centralizing information. And all the CCHQ is putting out is so this is your hunting area. Hello, reconnaissance has picked up this, and then just brand, broadcast it out to that area. Doesn't request a response. The idea was that would stop the British knowing what was going on because it was believed the British might be tracking signals, not decrypting them, might be tracking the source and their, their transmission. No. Mr. Micromanager here can never do that. 
He is not a good admiral. He tries, but he's just not. But I'll be interested in the live to hear your views on it. And this has been a lot longer than the other videos. Because it is, well, it's his birthday when it's coming out. And I'm, if I'm going to be rude about someone on their birthday, I need to explain why I'm being rude. So that's today's live. So 16th of September, Tekelai and Carl Bonnet's on his birthday. It's fair to ask, how good was, was he really? Well, the answer you're going to hear is... He does do some interesting things. But as an admiral and chief of staff, not very good. As an advocate for U-boats, probably better. Anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed and uh, take care.